Hi, it's Dr. Poole again, and this talk will be on pseudomembranous colitis and ischemic bowel disease. And these actually are somewhat linked together because they can frequently mimic each other. So hopefully this will be an informative way to be able to separate these out. All right, pseudomembranous colitis, which let's refer to it as C. difficile associated colitis, is... Um, frequently associated with pseudomembranes. Clostridium difficile is the causative organ organism of antibiotic-associated colitis. Uh, C. diff is a gram-positive anaerobic bacterium that causes antibiotic-associated colitis. Colonization of the intestinal tract occurs via the fecal-oral route and is facilitated by disruption of the normal intestinal flora due to antimicrobial therapy. The organism is capable of elaborating endoto uh, exotoxins that bind to receptors on intestinal epithelial cells, which triggers the inflammation and diarrhea. Uh, C. difficile infection is one of the most common healthcare associated infections and is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality amongst older adult hospitalized patients. So that's why it's an important topic to cover. So there actually is laboratory testing for C. difficile. Uh, there are several diagnostic tests available for the diagnosis of infection, and each has, of course, its advantages and limitations. Um, most people favor the use of PCR for laboratory diagnosis of C. difficile, either alone or as part of an algorithm, which includes initial screening test with an enzyme immunoassay, EIA, for glutamate dehydrogenase antigen and toxins A and B. A positive test result for C. difficile infection may be presumed in the setting of a positive e EIA uh, and a negative result may be presumed if both the EIAs and uh, the conf uh, confirmatory PCR are negative. Um, PCR is useful when the EIA results are discordant. Um, an algorithmic approach then is uh, thus favored. Um, the problem with PCR is that it doesn't distinguish between uh, carriage, which is asymptomatic, about 20% of hospitalized patients can be shown to be carriers, and C. difficile associated diarrhea. Um, the EIA, on the other hand, uh, for at least for glutamate dehydrogenase, doesn't distinguish between toxigenic and non-toxigenic strains. Um, the uh, EIA for the toxins uh, has the advantage of being a more rapid result, uh, but it does have a high false negativity rate. And so um, those uh, situations in which the patient clinically or, um, has uh, diarrhea and a recent history of antibiotic therapy uh, but the EIA is negative, would be appropriate to test for PCR. So this is just a schematic of an algorithmic approach to laboratory testing. Um, I won't test any specifics on it, but I thought it might be useful um, in the um, clinical discussion um, or if this comes up in the future. So grossly, uh, the... Uh, appearance gives the name of pseudomembranous colitis. And what you see is a uh, diffuse coat um, of uh, white, gray to tan, yellow purulent material, which forms a layer or pseudomembrane on the surface of the mucosa. Um, this can also uh, become uh, more discolored and um, uh, gray-brown on appearance but it's um, easily appreciated on gross examination. Uh, microscopically, uh, the panel on the right shows a typical appearance of neutrophils, which appear to be exploding from the crypt uh, epithelium and is referred to uh, uh, as a volcanic type eruption. Now, this is a microscopic appearance of what the pseudomembrane looks like, um, the red circle uh, shows this layer of fibrin, necrotic debris, and neutrophils, which is laying on the surface of the uh, mucosa. And all you can recognize of what's left over of the mucosa is this um, 
uh, layer of the crypt bases. This I thought nicely illustrates kind of the volcanic aspect of this. Um, the pseudomembrane uh, uh, forms sort of a cap or um, mushroom type appearance. I think of it like a mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. And uh, so this is um, this uh, pseudomembrane that's again sitting on the surface. This is the, the mucosa. The mucosa is, oops, sorry about that. The mucosa is left over. Uh, from uh, the necrosis on the top, and you can see normal mucosa on either side, and then the submucosa underneath, just for orientation. Okay, unfortunately, pseudomembranes are nonspecific. They can be seen in other diseases than C. difficile associated colitis, so that's why I prefer that term. Um, and one of these is ischemic colitis, or ischemic bowel disease. Ischemic uh, bowel disease can either be chronic or acute. Uh, the chronic nature of it is from progressive hypoperfusion, and this is usually from uh, some kind of systemic um, hypoperfusion. And so what you see in this typically is superficial mucosal ischemia or infarction. The acute uh, form is caused by some kind of vascular obstruction to the arterial supply or uh, uncommonly venous supply to the colon, and this results in transmural infarction. So the causes of chronic hypoperfusion are the causes of systemic hypoperfusion in general. They just happen to affect the bowel in this case. So the usual suspects, congestive heart failure, shock, dehydration, vasoconstricted drugs, and uncommonly systemic vasculitides. The causes of acute vascular obstruction, on the other hand, are local. Uh, and this could be due to severe atherosclerosis of the uh, celiac trunk or the superior or inferior mesenteric arteries or their major branches, an abdominal aortic aneurysm, which may compromise the uh, ostia of these vessels, hypercoagulable states, uh, oral contraceptive use, and then, of course, emboli such as from a vegetation on a heart valve could cause, uh, could dislodge and end up uh, blocking arterial supply in the colon. This is one of those beautiful times when I can link up with the anatomy and histology and uh, just point out that the intestinal vascular anatomy is related to the location of the ischemia. So there is actually a reason why you're learning all this stuff together. Intestinal segments located near the terminal distribution of their arterial supply are the most vulnerable to ischemia, and these are called watershed zones. Uh, two specifically are the splenic flexure of the colon, and then the uh, sigmoid colon slash proximal rectum, uh, where you reach the terminal distribution of the inferior mesenteric artery and the uh, proximal or superior aspects of the some of the pelvic arteries, the pudendal artery and the um, iliac arteries. Okay, uh, ischemic colitis should be suspected when you see focal colitis identified in these watershed areas. The second aspect of vascular anatomy is that the intestinal capillaries run from the bases of the crypts to the surface and then they make a sharp hairpin turn into the postcapillary venules to return to the portal venous system. This makes the superficial mucosa more vulnerable to ischemia relative to the deep mucosa. And this arrangement is certainly reflected in pathological changes that can be seen in early acute or in chronic ischemia, where the superficial mucosa is more affected than the deep. All right, now to the good stuff, morphology. Grossly, the affected uh, segment of bowel will have a dark or dusky gray-red to purple-black appearance. You often see thin fibrinous adhesions uh, from the infarct. Um, the mucosa is diffusely hemorrhagic. It's ulcerated, and it's usually sharply demarcated from the surrounding uh, better vascularized mucosa. Um, the wall is edematous. Usually when um, there's a, uh, the, it's ischemic, 
or becomes frankly necrotic and affects all three layers or is transmural. And microscopically, you've already learned this stuff before. Um, in the acute or early phase, you get necrosis of the superficial mucosa with neutrophils and acute hemorrhage. Uh, later on, the um, uh, microscopic appearance becomes coagulative necrosis because it's an infarct and it is transmural. So you'll see uh, coagulative necrosis of all three layers of the bowel wall. Um, the late or chronic micros microscopic appearance is a little more subtle. Um, there's gradual atrophy of crypts because they're not getting enough blood. Uh, lamina propria fibrosis and hemosiderin, which, uh, which is a reflection of chronic hemorrhage. So this is uh, gross uh, and microscopic photographs on the left. The external surface of the bowel again has this dusky, uh, dark, uh, gray-red appearance. Uh, when you open up the bowel wall in panel B, uh, the mucosa also appears diffusely uh, brown-red. But interestingly, the mucosal folds are typically preserved. Um, to the right, uh, you see changes of um, um, chronic ischemia. Again, usually the superficial aspects of the crypts um, are affected. There's fibrosis in the uh, lamina propria, uh, especially superficially. And then this uh, brown material is hemosiderin that's de deposited in the submucosa. I'll show you a couple slides Dr. Giacotti shared with me for this presentation. I thought this uh, image really nicely shows the sharp demarcation uh, between the viable um, uh, mucosa on the right here and the uh, ischemic or infarcted uh, bowel here on the left. And uh, again, compare and contrast the, uh, the dark uh, brown-red color on the left with the normal uh, light tan appearance of normal mucosa on the, on the right. This microscopic image again shows the uh, necrosis of the superficial crypts. Uh, this, notice that the surface is ulcerated. There's uh, red blood cells uh, in the lamina propria. There's also some evidence that this is uh, kind of an acute on chronic thing because the lamina propria is fibrotic. The crypts are small in caliber. Uh, that is, they're atrophic and kind of widely separated by this fibrosis in the lamina propria. So you can have pseudomembrane formation in ischemic bowel disease, and that's why I thought it would be good to discuss these together. Um, it can be associated with either acute or chronic ischemia. Uh, it's interesting that the pathophysiology is somewhat similar in that there's a change in nor normal flora that results in bacterial superinfection and the formation of exo- and endotoxins um, by the resulting organisms. Pathologically, it's indistinguishable from C. difficile associated colitis. So we have to think about um, uh, when uh, approaching a patient, uh, their history, history of antibiotic therapy, um, la um, laboratory tests, and, and uh, the location. Where is this? Is this located in a uh, watershed zone, etc.? And finally, uh, if there is endoscopy and biopsies, we can look for some specific um, microscopic features to help sort these out as well. And that's why you need me, or hopefully one of you. So what did I learn? Not all that is pseudomembrane is pseudomembranous colitis. So we want to use the term C. difficile associated colitis, which occurs from antibiotic therapy and colonization by toxigenic strains of the organism. There's some lab tests you can use to help make the diagnosis, and there's some morphologic clues, uh, pseudomembranes, but also these volcanic eruptions of pus from the necrotic crypts. Ischemic bowel disease, I learned, can be either acute or chronic. The, um, acute ischemic bowel disease is due to local vascular obstruction, while chronic ischemic bowel disease is due to systemic hypoperfusion. So contrast the causes between acute and chronic. 
You can also contrast the pathology between transmural infarction versus uh, an ongoing ischemic colitis. Uh, be aware of the relationship between the intestinal vascular anatomy to the pathology, specifically um, watershed areas. In the morphology, sharply demarcated, there's a range from superficial ulceration to outright transmural coagulative necrosis. So I hope that this uh, talk has made you hungry, or at least hungry for more pathology. See you next time. Bye.